Well, we're going to go into the news. Um, the hot news, you know, released this morning. Uh, I got my normal dose from um, from Medium. What does 40 years of sobriety look like? Alcohol is not your friend. It's so reassuring, isn't it, to know that we're wiping out alcohol? Yeah, it'll be gone soon. It'll be gone. And, and what a great solution to the problem of drugs and alcohol in America to tell people just not to use them. We're going to make um, Nancy Reagan, and this is a little before your time, just say no. Mm -hmm. She's an ancient saint. Uh, she's not Catholic, but they're going to make her a saint. I don't remember and, Nancy Reagan's just say no, and who knew that she was a prophet? Maybe, you know, re-enlivening her vision years later. People, of course, laugh at Nancy Reagan. Mm -hmm. Oh, just say no, that's so stupid. And yeah, you know, major, as I pointed out in my last blog post, um, WebMD listed 15 traits of alcohol, and all of them were bad. Mm -hmm. Why the hell are people so crazy and stupid that they keep drinking when only bad things happen from alcohol? And if we just keep at it, if we just work a little bit harder, we'll convince everybody not to drink. It's just- Would you say that when you meet somebody who doesn't drink, uh, how do I put this? That's the anomaly, right? I mean, when I meet someone who doesn't drink, I think, huh, interesting. I don't care. I just am thinking you're one of uh, many people who I know, or one of only a few people I know who don't drink, but if I meet somebody who doesn't. Well, you happen to live in Burlington, Vermont. There are colossal differences in drinking levels across the United States. If I go to a bar in New York City and I say, how many people, what percentage of people drink, they'll go 95%. Uh, so the figure actually in the United States is somewhat over 50%, counting drinking, you know, once a month at least. But there are states in the union where people drink, like about 35% of people drink. Do you know what those states are? Say that again. I didn't understand what you, the mm -hmm. states of the union. Some oh, states we're, in the United we're only 35, States. We're only 35% of the population drink. Cut out. Utah doesn't count. Why? Don't I oh, count? Oh, Mormon. Mormon uh, Mormons not, aren't supposed to drink. Right. Although, only within the last 10 or 15 years, you couldn't buy a drink in Utah. But within the last 10 or 15 years, Salt Lake City now sells drinks, regular drinks. And when you used to, um, in Utah, they used to have black curtains near the bars so that people couldn't see people drinking. And uh, Mother Jones had a big article by a woman who grew up in that environment, drank too much, got breast cancer and blamed it on that. And Mother Jones is one of the most progressive magazines. It's the most progressive. She seemed to be recommending going back to that stage. But why is Salt Lake City in particular not going in the direction, has gone away from putting black curtains between the bar and now allowing people to buy drinks? Why, why has that happened? And you tell me. Because it's just gotten part of the mainstream of America and, you know, tourists come there and business people come there and they drink. And the upper echelon of America drinks. So it's a retrograde philosophy. And Mother Jones, the Progressive Magazine, endorsed it. And mm -hmm. WebMD, you know, you would think one of the most advanced medical advice providers is telling people only bad things about alcohol. It, we're actually, it's, it's hard to say we're going backwards, but in major ways, our primary approach to alcohol and drugs is a century and more older. And, and we're never going to change. You were kind of saying that there's a subtext to the, you know, just don't drink because there's, it's implied that people who are, have anything to do with the world 
in his proceedings are going to drink. You said the upper echelon, I think, to use your words. And so mm -hmm. when people say, you know, if you've got problems with alcohol, just don't drink or just don't drink and you won't have problems. There's that's targeted toward a certain group of people. Well, I, my latest blog post addressed the questions in WebMD and it said to WebMD and the author of the article, well, do you drink? I don't, I know nothing about that person, but 80 to 90% of doctors drink because they're upper echelon people. And remember there's bars, when you go to a restaurant in New York City, everybody has alcohol at their table. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that used to amuse me, I like to go to Middle Eastern restaurants with Alta Ann, and many of the customers are Muslim not to be confused with Mormon, and they're not allowed to drink, but everybody there had alcohol because the upper echelon of the world behaves the same. People, Muslims in New York are there with the United Nations or some, you know, big international corporation. I'm, I'm not talking about their working class Muslims in, in New York. They're, they weren't at these particular restaurants in Manhattan. And the upper echelon behaves the same, they drink alcohol, they enjoy it, they live longer. And so it's sort of like a well-kept secret that WebMD wants to prevent the world from knowing. They want to discourage poor people from drinking. There you go. Because, you know, doctors drink. So I said, well, do you, I pose these possible questions. Do you drink? Um, uh, how, when do you drink? And, you know, when they'll say something like wine with dinner and when I go out, I have a special cocktail or maybe a nice scotch. And then I say, what did you teach your children to do? And they say, well, I teach them to, to deal with alcohol appropriately. And then I say, well, what about this way you're communicating strictly through negative information? Is that how you deal with your children? And of course, no sensible upper middle class American answers that yes. Oh, I only communicate with my children by telling them the dangers in life and warning them not to do things. Everybody knows the correct answer to that is to get them positively engaged in life and to view them their health in a positive manner and to increase their self-efficacy. So to we be have right, to be on the nose with it. What you're trying to get to is something like, what is it about you or the people you know and love? Uh, what is it about your lives that create this space where you can drink? even though you're telling other people they can't what's the magic so you know what what's what's going on with you that you are the, the, the group i know i used to know i guess i still know them the world epidemiological society for alcohol it's called kettle brew and they're the people behind their no safe level of drinking i know those people all of them all of them drink alcohol mm. all of them <clears throat> They, it it's would be nasty. ridiculous to have a conference where, they, you know, if you go to some recovery conferences, they don't have alcohol. Kettle Brew Society doesn't have conferences without alcohol. <laughs> they would consider that crazy. And, uh, you know, I hate to use the word uncivilized. Um, it's sort of like public health for other people. And the question is, where does that come from? And it comes from the temperance roots of America, where... That's just considered good, telling people not to drink. So, you know, I got an email. Uh, what does 40 years of sobriety look like? Alcohol is not your friend. So that tradition exists for 150, 200 years. Um, and then you sent to me, Boko is endorsing um, a new um, life-saving um opioid vaccine so what's i don't what's an opioid vaccine would you think or it has to i mean there's something to do with either targeting the way that people metabolize opioids or it has to do with something in the brain those are the only two things that people ever put forward mm -hmm. for a vaccine quote unquote for opioids so how does it work exactly? Just what does an opioid vaccine do? It can't pretend, it can't prevent you from taking opioids because right. people have to take painkillers. 
So presumably, um, it allows you to take opioids but not become addicted, but most people don't become addicted already. And you know, uh, when I write about the history of addiction, the search for a non-addictive analgesic painkiller is as old as the hills. It's 200 years old. It started with morphine and then heroin and then uh, IV injection and then barbiturates and then synthetic narcotics. They've all been introduced. Well, we finally got a non-addictive analgesic. And my point is people get addicted to analgesia. But the main point that I'm making here is if you just sit here looking at things coming in your transom, you'll be going, huh, is this a thousand years old? Am I living in the past? They're telling, people are bragging that they're in recovery for 40 years. In the 19th century America, people quit drinking all the time. Temperance was spread all over the country. And ironically, I don't want to complicate things. There was no temperance with opioids in the 19th century. That didn't come until the 20th century. And it's, it's too mind-bending to even mention it, but I can't avoid it. Alcohol was presented the way opioids are, in the 19th century, the way opioids are presented now. If you drank, you couldn't control it, you become addicted. I have a panel of eight uh, po photos in my apartment. <clears throat> That's the kind of pervert I am, uh, called The Bottle. And it's a guy, he has a little bit of wine at dinner in frame one. And in frame eight, he's in prison because he murdered his wife and his daughter's a prostitute and his son's some kind of a gambler or pimp. And that was, that's the view that we had of alcohol, which was transposed to opioids. So <clears throat> we combine this unholy alliance of a tradition of temperance and fantastical views about what's going to happen um, with medical advances. And this is just something, I, I, you know, I've written in 1981. Reductionism is the point of view that human behavior can successfully be resolved into its biological components, components that may then in turn be described as chemical and electrical events. Reductionism is not itself a theory, since it does not present testable hypotheses that tend either to support or to disprove it. It is more of a philosophy or a faith in the ultimate nature of things. So you, um, so let's talk, let's apply that to the opioid vaccine. Right. So uh, we, the, the idea there, what it comes down to is, let's do something to a person's body that, that God willing will keep them from enjoying the experience of taking an opioid. That would take away the enjoyment. Or and possibly so, and the, the idea is that the is idea that is that they can't be addicted. They can't enjoy the pill, they can't be addicted to it. Which but is that experiential hypothesis. They might say that you point out a good thing. Would they say they could still enjoy it and have the effects of it, but that won't be addictive? And of course, what my main yeah. point is. Um, the potential relationships between these substances, uh, this optimism centers around several areas of research and speculation in neurosciences, the discovery of neurotransmitters such as serotonin and norepinephrine and of endogenous opioid peptoids, endorphins, the potential relationship between these substances, is schizophrenia, depression, addiction, and pain. And I say, and reductionist thought holds out the promise of clear-cut remedies to problems that otherwise seem painful beyond solution. Mm -hmm. And what I say, there's an alternative view of psychology that contradicts many manifestations of reductionism. This is the belief that the study of psychology is intended to make sense of the world as experienced by human beings, and that any psychological analysis or treatment which fails to incorporate individual personality and subjective needs or situation and cultural variables will be fail. So what you're saying is, it's it's not clear that they're saying, oh, you won't enjoy opioids and then therefore you won't be addicted. It's not clear whether they're saying that or whether they're saying, well, opioids just have the same effect on people. And for some people that's an enjoyable effect. 
However, they won't become addicted despite that because their view, crazy Nora Volkow's view is that addiction occurs at some other level mm -hmm. beyond the human being. You think it's even more reductionist than I gave them credit for. You're somewhere, you're trying to rationalize the two. So sitting here at my transom, I'm reading about people who are saying the 19, presenting 19th century temperance views. I gave up drinking. I haven't, you know, when people would, they did lectures. They would go, I gave up that devil alcohol. And now I walk in the sunshine on the sunny side of the street. And I haven't had a drink in, you know, 10 years or 40 years. That same temperance lecture mm. exists. And the same for Kakta, that's Yiddish, crappy concept that, oh, addiction exists at some other level than the sentient human being. And so we'll be able to cure addiction and people will still, what, take opioids and not have pain, but they won't become addicted to opioids. Um, we'll never get rid of that. And, and of course, at some, there's two things that can be said about that. Isn't it ironic that logically the two disease approaches are 100% opposite? Yeah. One is totally oh. like, I'm going to walk in the light of God. And the other is, oh, we'll get bypass all of that. And that's a guy did a four part series on addiction. Um, he was a food specialist and he emphasized the social causes of food. So he had one about Hispanic workers. And then he had one on addiction. He's a recovering alcoholic. And so he's come up with the innovation in the food world of eliminating alcohol from meals. What an incredible advance. After centuries, after millennia of people learning to integrate alcohol and eating of, you know, alcohol-based foods, and selecting the right wine or the wine that most enables people to enjoy dinner, which everybody at Kettle Brun does, and all those doctors do. He's eliminating alcohol from the diet. And the second thing he interviewed, he went to Hazleton and he interviewed William Cope Moyers, who I sort of know his family. I know the Moyers family. And in 1997, Will, Bill Moyers had a special on addiction. And it combined two things, AA and the great brain discoveries that were going to eliminate addiction. And he interviewed William Cope Moyers, Bill Moyers' son, who was famously addicted, but now represents Hazleton and Betty Ford. I actually asked him to, when I told him I wrote my memoir, he said, oh, I'll get a copy. And I said, oh, great, you can like, write me a blurb. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Let us see and that. But... In 1997, they had they showed some scientists looking at brain scans, and this new special occurred in 2020. They showed the exact same people in Minnesota looking at brain scans. But what's his point? His point is that addiction is getting uh, irreversibly worse. So he's sort of saying it's we're trying to encourage critical thinking people the most basic logic doesn't play any role in this he blow aa's been around since 1939 we have all these great advances in science which were being heralded as i pointed out in 1981 and re and re-upped by bill moyers in 1997 and they're being re-upped now in 2021 <clears throat> that brain science is going to cure addiction and addiction, you know, everybody's aware that 93,000 people died, drug-related deaths in the year 2020, not all opioids. And so people are sitting there saying, oh, AA is God's gift to humanity. But we're doubling down by creating a new science where we, we study brain scans and we eliminate addiction. We're living in a golden era with one unfortunate side effect drug-related deaths and mortality and health 
have depreciated steadily since the 1980s. And nobody finds that troubling. If you say to people, if I say, I haven't said this yet, I haven't had the guts to say to Ethan Nadelman, well, uh, MO, um, there's a new study, they did a new, the new <clears throat> new survey of drugs and health found something unbelievable to me. They say only 50% of people with opioid use disorders are receiving treatment. 50% is un, it's unimaginable. When Nisark studied how many people who were alcohol dependent entered alcohol treatment, it was 10%. Because how do people actually, you know, how many people actually enter treatment? Treatment is universal almost in the United States now. They're complaining that only, you know, you can't get half the people to get a vaccination to save their lives. And half of people have been in opioid use disorder of who have had an opioid use disorder have right. been in treatment. And of course, everybody's, you know, Maya Salovitz and Zach Siegel are all saying, oh, it's horrible that not enough people are getting into uh, medication treatment for drugs and addiction. Thank God we're pushing to get more in all the time. Oh, 93,000 people died last year. Yeah, it puts the onus on another sector, doesn't it? It's the idea that, uh, you know, if we could just get the infrastructure in place to do what we already know works, then it'll be great. And, and meanwhile, there's just, you know, the more we do what we know works, in quotes, let's say, uh, yeah, we're not getting results. And I, met, I knew a woman who was in psychoanalysis for 30 years, and I said, well, isn't your life supposed to get better? And she said this to me, oh, the way it works is your way life gets worse and worse until finally, when you get to the real nut of the problem, it's like trauma theory, then your life gets better. And that seems to be the model that they're working on. And nobody's, it, it allows us to just keep going on. Well, things are great. We're going to progress. And I have a theory most of the people, the main body of people who die, we don't care if they die. They're inner city African-Americans and they're rural in Appalachia, New England. So it doesn't matter. We have these abstract theories and people keep dying. I hate to say it, we don't care. Hmm. We like the theories more importantly <clears throat> than we like life and death. I know I have a sort of pessimistic view of the world. I can't help it. Well, no. Uh, can I ask? Uh, let me ask you a clinical question that has to do with the point that you made earlier. I was just thinking about the idea that you have to wait until you get to the very core of your worst issues in life, and then things get better. You know, hitting bottom or whatever. Um, how, how do you think clinically is the appropriate way to address? So let's see. I would never tell somebody, "Hey, things could always get worse." Um, that's that could be seen as somewhat pessimistic you'd have to frame that a little better how do you say that to people well everybody knows that's psychotic i mean people that we just dis i disagree with maya salovitz mm -hmm. says well hitting bottom what kind of a right, right. is that although she herself hit bottom so she had to escape her own experience she was down to 80 pounds she was shooting up regularly with speed balls but even, she, not even she, she's not a dumb woman, for God's sake, says, well, that it makes no sense for people to get to the worst point to get better. And cognitive behavior therapy is built on a, a gradualistic assumption, which is against a the disease theory. By the way, you know, among my great enemies, Robin Room, looking at epidemiological data, the number of people that fit into the prototypical AA description of an alcohol, a constant loss of control drinking is 1%, less than 1% of the population. Mm. That's not, when people get problems, even the worst drug and alcohol problems, they sort of even, they don't look like alcoholics and drug addicts like you see on television. Those are practically non-existent. People right. have a variety of problems that go up and down uh, with their lives. So waiting for people to crash and hit bottom in a way doesn't happen and you know clinically speaking as i you know as my and other and everybody recognizes you don't treat people by saying oh 
you have to practically die, then we can really make some headway. That, that Nobody does that. So just to clear, this, sounds, this is elementary to you, but I just, uh, I know that some people listening, I, we get some of these comments sometimes. And uh, so there's just two different ways of thinking about this. There's a sort of cognitive behavioral approach, which says, as you're moving forward in a journey, you can recall past events and you can say, what was sort of the worst moment of my addiction career, let's say, and why do I want to move away from that? That's something like a bottom i guess in that it, you can recall it as some of the worst uh, experiences that you had that related to your addiction that's completely different than saying you need to continue to torture yourself until you hit some lower level i mean people have pointed out that you're actually encouraging people to have worse outcomes mm -hmm. you're of course you're not encouraging their self their agency and telling them they have the power to reverse things and most people don't have those terrible worst outcomes so you don't want to wait for them and you certainly don't want to encourage them it's the opposite of appropriate therapy um and you know i mean it's standard to see now in the at the same time that we still adhere to the disease theory to see for you know, standard wisdom is to approach, I don't even want to use the word attack, substance problems before they reach mm -hmm. their worst thing. And of course, people always say, well, we should prevent substance problems. Then we get back to uh, uh, WebMD saying, oh, never drink or you know, only bad things about alcohol. That's not how you encourage people to learn to cope with and process substance use. We're in a universe where substance use in a greater variety of forms is more universal than ever. I mean, alcohol is always gonna be with us and maybe it'll go up and down, but of course we're now impressed with synthetic narcotics and they're far from the only drugs that are being synthesized. Oh, well, uh, you sent me something by that cuckoo guy um dreamland saying meth has been modified so it's not meth anymore There's, we need a new word for methamphetamines but that's that's just the science of drug dealing they're constantly coming up with new synthetics and combinations um by the way um another news item they released the autopsy. Do you, do you know what The Wire is? Yeah. You mean the show? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The and you know the guy, movie. the drug dealer guy. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. What's his name? You know his name? Uh, I forget it. He died. <clears throat> and they called it an overdose. Right. An overdose suggests that you're taking too much of one thing. Michael Williams, by the way. I had to look Michael at it. Williams. It's on the tip of my tongue. On his autopsy report, because it has one word there. It, 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 they listed four drugs. They listed um, fentanyl, and then they listed some long word with fentanyl in it. Mm -hmm. You know? There's some variety of fentanyl. Some sort of acetyl fentanyl, whatever it was. Yeah. Yes. And heroin and, and cocaine. So when you, you know, that, that's not an overdose. And that's not an overdose of taking too much of one drug. You know, you, you do wonder what was on his mind. You do wonder... And so there's one example of where telling people, oh, well, we don't tell, well, we tell people not to take painkillers. We try not to get them to take painkillers. We tell them not to drink. But, but that message, the correct harm reduction message is, well, to lead a good life, to feel good about yourself. But, you know, if you're going to take a strong sedative drug, stick to one at a time it's sort of like you know when you learn to drink don't mix every cocktail when you have that alcohol you're gonna have a worse reaction to it so then i want to move on to um 
diagnosis envy. You're a person who talks about your own life where you at one point were an AD, were you an ADD guy or an ADHD guy? ADHD. I don't think that ADD was a diagnosis anymore by the time I was tested for it. I'm so old, as I often say, I'm from, they used to have, um, they didn't even have ADHD. What do they used to call people like me? It had the word hyper in it, I think. And I'm so old. Um, they didn't use to diagnose. I was born in 46. They didn't use to diagnose people hmm. in the 50s. Um, things have changed. Now, you personally, how did you react? You came to reject and dislike that label. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a, I'll give you the genesis, and then I'll, and then uh, my newfound reaction to it. But it felt nice. It's sort of like a oh, nice warm blanket it's to cover my problems with because it it did describe. You know, it's sort of like a horoscope. You can describe some of the the traits that. And then you say, well, and that's uh, an issue and that's not your fault. And so I think, oh, great. You know, so there's all these issues. It's not my fault. But the more I wanted to make something of myself, the more uh, I realized that you can't rely on. I, I don't want to be um, chained to this diagnosis. <clears throat> so it was uh, comforting at a time, but it really put a ceiling on my ability to make something of myself. It doesn't do it. It, it, it helps your... It psychologically re aligns things right right but it doesn't help you except they claim medication will help you so there's an article in the times that shows how far you and i are out of touch and it's beyond belief how far you and i are out of touch <laughs> it's by lily barana my mental health issues have a name bruce what can you possibly imagine what she's talking about? No. <laughs> and like Mr. Springsteen, I resolved to release the same. Uh, yeah, I already read it. So I, did, I did know that she was talking about that. <laughs> so this is how it begins. Uh, we're ADHD, anxiety, depression. I'd hit a comorbidity hat trick. Comorbidity, the ominous sounding term for simultaneously occurring conditions, is common. Many people with ADHD have another mental health condition. And most often that's depression, anxiety. Mm -hmm. So how, where do you think she's coming from with this? You know, ADHD, anxiety, depression, I'd hit a comorbidity hat trick. Well, what do you think, how, what is her reaction to that statement, do you think? The more the merrier. She's glorifying it. And she regrets that she was di denied the ADHD. Right. People I missed a differential diagnosis for her. They, they could have yeah, done something better. Sorry. To interrupt. I'm not surprised my ADHD diagnosis came last. Research shows that women are undiagnosed, improperly diagnosed, and diagnosed much later in life than boys and men. This is part, in her mind, of the feminine... You know, it, the MO used to be that women had more affective disorders mm -hmm. yeah, and right. men had more acting out disorders, which still seems to work fairly well. So she's regretting that she didn't get an ADHD diagnosis because she was a woman. Doesn't that say something about what the diagnosis, the nature of a diagnosis? It's a description of what people are like. And there are people who say that. There are people who say that some small minority of kooks say well they're criminalizing childhood bo boyhood mm. but there's a movement which i'm going to get into which says that specifically applies to african-american males mm. after my adhd diagnosis i was overcome with emotion Relief, yes, at having an explanation for why my mind pinged between daydreaming, emotional overload, and obsessive for focus. 
but also shame, anxiety, and grief. So, so you okay. greeted your own diagnosis in that way with relief. It, it's sort of like, oh, I've got an explanation. Right. But think of it. Yeah, I, I understand it. I certainly, when you say it to me, I understand it. Sitting there welcoming emotions. Oh my God, I've got a mental disorder. That's like a great thing. And of course, but also shame, anxiety, and grief. Obviously, it's, we didn't use, the, she thinks shame, uh, anxiety, and grief are dispelled by these modern diagnoses, but there's a whole other way to view it, which is if we didn't point them out and view them as aberrations, we'd have less shame, anxiety, and grief. And, you know, it also ties into um, the logic, the possible logic behind the opioid vaccine. You get, it's a nice headline that makes people feel a little bit warm and fuzzy because they get to say, we're really progressing, you know, we're beyond psychology now, we're doing, we're in the brain, or, or whatever, and uh, so that can make you feel okay for a minute, until you think about it, like, who, who do you want getting that surgery, um, your, your son or daughter, uh, your mother or father, your, you know what I mean, and when I think about diagnosis, I think about it the same way, like, it, it can make you feel good for a little while, but then, I think that everyone I've ever worked with whose kids are diagnosed with something who have felt good about it, they run into these problems where they say, well, yeah, I like the diagnosis, but how come they keep treating my kid like a cookie cutter, you know, cut out? So it, it strikes and me. It's so that they're also saying there's something wrong with my son or daughter. And they're also saying it's who they are. And they're also saying it's permanent. That's who right. they are. It's a whole mindset, and um, people still, as you point out, have a negative reaction to part of that, and they're told, oh, wake up, get become woke. Mm -hmm. In the new medical world, there's nothing at all to worry about or be ashamed of if your child has that diagnosis. Right. It gets worse. Finding the proper medication, or what's the next word going to be? Treatment? Medications. Oh, 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 all right. The more, the more everything. Having mental health conditions is more often a wavy course than a straight line. Can you imagine that? If you know people and, and people are taking, they're trying, they have these chemists who are trying to balance all of these different medications for all of these proposed mental disorders, it's right. hard to do. You can't get the same medication for depression and anxiety. Eventually, I found I function and feel best with daily Lexapro, extended release Adderall, and the occasional Clonopin for intense spikes or anxiety. <laughs> and so, yeah. so luckily they make drugs for the side effects of other drugs. And listen to this. this is, these are all stated as positives. I cling to these pills like the lifeline they are. Traveling with my meds in a tote bag clutched over my shoulder. Pills rattling in their plaster amber bottles, making each step like psychopharmacological maracas. It almost sounds like she's doing a, a takedown of what she's actually putting up. She's like dancing her life with vigilance plus medication and regular therapy. I feel, you think she's gonna say, I feel great? No, she's gonna say, I. I've read this, but I don't remember. But it's something like baseline or something like that. I feel, I feel almost mostly okay most of the time. Right. You know, you you want to get over pneumonia. Right. You don't want to get polio. That's not the way it works with these diseases. You're struggling constantly. They're mixing the medications, and you're mostly okay. My work gets done. My obligations met. The black 
dog days stand stark in their rare awfulness. One important part of this journey is identifying how mental illness and executive dysfunction manifest in life. It was likely, so she calls this Bruce. Bruce Springsteen, born to be free, is now the epitome of self of diagnosis and medication. There are a lot of competing ideas there. Uh, uh, going first on. of all, yeah, first of all, you name it. Um, I mean, she really does treat this diagnosis like it's someone else traveling with her. And so it's, it's reifying it. It's this thing that's in her pocket or whatever in her soul. It's um, like she's and, separated from herself. <laughs> and the idea, the the irony that she calls it <laughs> Bruce Springsteen Bruce. talking about freedom. She calls yeah. it Bruce. <laughs> yeah. She names it after somebody else. I, doesn't that sound a little inauthentic? I, I'm just going to make a crazy statement. An authentic thing is to sort of say, geez, I have mood swings, or I can get anxious, but you know, I'm a good person, I'm productive. I probably should try to minimize those. That to me is authenticity. She's taking a host of varying medications to feel mostly okay with only a few dark down days, but that's not the worst part. It was likely ADHD that spurred me into buying a last minute ticket to Springsteen on Broadway. So she only went to see Springsteen because of her disease. It was likely ADHD that spurred me into buying a last minute ticket to Springsteen on Broadway. Hmm. What a funny, I mean, when people used to say, oh, I like Bruce Springsteen, so I bought a ticket to go see him. You know, I, I enjoy him. I took some of the money I make. That's the old way of thinking. In July, while evading sleep at 1 a.m., so she was having a bad night. This particular form of executive dysfunction is known for impulsivity after all. I, buying a ticket to a concert is impulsivity? I, I, well, and, and by her standards, a good concert, right? So she, her impulsivity, her disease made her have a good time. It gets worse. I took my Adderall in the morning of the show. Attending Unmandicated would have had my mind wandering as I watched Springsteen perform. Is that the worst thing in the world? That's what I go for when I, that's what I'm trying to do when I watch music. Start, you know, peeling out. Not, I mean, remember people used to take, and still take marijuana for that effect. I wonder what song will do next. You know what song is great? Candy's Room. Oh man, I should have gotten some candy at the concession. That's, she's describing her mind. Mm -hmm. If she were not medicated. No. But once the show began, I was fixed on the legend in the spotlight, unfurling his life story from peak to veil and peeling out songs. Nothing else save for the woman next to me. Silently, this is the worst part. This makes me cry. Silently weeping diverted my attention. Why was she weeping? Because she was her mind was wandering. Music. And this is the next deep. sentence. It's in parenthesis. I'd have cried too, but Adderall and Lexapro dancing cheek to cheek in my bloodstream made it all but impossible. What's she saying? She can't be emotionally moved by the music to tears of joy or sadness because the drugs won't permit her. The drugs are trapped in an emotional cage. So she's been, she's proclaiming that she's reduced her uh, anxiety and whatever the ill effects are of her impulsivity and everything else. And she's okay that she's had to make the sacrifice of being able to feel a range of emotions in order to do that. Because, you know, why people don't, you know, <clears throat> 
when people, one mystery of antipsychotic drugs, you know, usually if you can take a drug and it makes you better, you don't have to hard sell that drug. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Right, right, right. People are always getting off of psychiatric medications and medications for opioid use disorder. And why is that? And if you sort of ask them, they say, well, I kind of like the feelings that are being suppressed or my normal emotions have been taken away from me and they don't want to do that. And isn't that a kind of a healthy impulse? And of course, what you're saying is, well, they're crazy people. They don't know what's good for them, but everybody knows what they want. I mean, when people say, I feel better if I don't take the medication, there's no argument with that person. That, that, they had to invent addiction to explain that. Well, I take this drug, and then they say, oh, you don't want to take this drug. You're addicted. That's what makes you take that drug. As I count not my pills, I count my blessings. Isn't it funny how a cluster of diagnoses can rob with one hand that once managed grant you purpose with another? And isn't it funny how an entire constellation of thoughts and an entire way of being can spin out from a single star? Well, Lily Baran is the author of four books. Most recently, Grace for Amateur, Field Notes for a Journey Back to Faith. So what strikes me about that is, so she's written four books. That takes a certain amount of concentration, A. Mm -hmm. I think she's religious. Um, you're anxious, you're afraid, and I have just a solution. This is totally out of left. This was in the same issue in the New York Times by Stephen Graham Jones. Horror fans have known that the genre is more than a nightmare carnival. Horror is and always has been in dialogue with anxieties and fears of time. Um, during the Great Depression, the misery and economic strife were embodied by monsters like Dracula, Frankenstein, and the mummy. He's saying we all have anxieties and fears, and that's why we read and watch movies like The Thing, and Frankenstein, because they express that side of being a human being and that part of human experience. That's sort of what she's cutting off from. Here's another article. Navigating my son's ADHD made me realize I had it too. This gets back to, mm -hmm. uh, this is Heidi Borst. Um, experts say some symptoms, especially in women, are mistaken for other conditions, such as mood disorders or depression. In other words, she gave her son ADHD medications. That's the way it usually goes with young boys. Then she realized that she wasn't anxiety, anxious or depressed. Mm -hmm. she had, although that's not what, that's not what um, Lily Barana did. Lily Barana got all of them. Now I want to dial back to something. I'd have cried too, but Adderall and Lexapro dancing cheek to dancing cheek to cheek. There's a song with that lyric. In my bloodstream made it all but impossible for me to cry. If she says something really sad, like people dying in Africa, can she not cry now? Hmm. Shalanda Bush, I believe... <laughs> If I had to guess that Lily Barana is African American, um, I would guess that Stephen Graham Jones and Heidi Borster White, the one who likes horror movies and the woman who learned she had ADHD because her son had it. I believe this next woman is African American, Shalanda Bush Daniels. Examining the overrepresentation of African American males in special education. The literature review focuses on the overrepresentation of African American males in special education. The most prevalent factors that contribute to this epidemic are poverty and the perceptions of teachers, their attitudes towards African American men, and the lack of cultural understandings. 
Not only does this literature review focus on identifying the problem, but it also includes various intervention and solution strategies, which will improve the equity of placement and ultimately increase the overall attendance rate of African-American males in areas of higher education and give them the opportunity to attain prominent positions in the workforce. In my opinion, this will inevitably solidify the state of black family structure. What she's saying that African-Americans are way overrepresented in special education. To get in special education, the, the most common route is to be diagnosed with ADHD. Mm -hmm. She's saying that's a bias of the system. Yeah. That teachers can identify with these kids. Perhaps they lack some standard behavioral skill. You, well, you're a person, you deal with that thing. In Vermont, it's not that it's black students, but it's that they're students who are poor or they just, they don't fit the mold. I've called bullshit on that for years, uh, working with these kids who are bright and have a lot of energy and interested in things, but they're not interested in things that the school uh, preaches to them. So I think that, I mean, this strikes me as something honest that she's reporting on here. And so this woman is saying that work, you, you live in Vermont's a kind of white state. Right, right. But I could understand poor that. People, poor people, poor people. Yeah. And she's saying it's just another hammer to disadvantage people with. Mm -hmm. And she identifies it with race. Well, Baran is saying, oh, thank God, I was finally diagnosed as an African-American woman with ADHD. And this woman, Shalonda Bush Daniels, is trying to reverse that, African-Americans being diagnosed with that. For over 10 years, I have been employed by the New York City Department of Education. During these years, I have witnessed that within the special education population of the school, the majority of students were black and Hispanic. And I'm concerned with the huge disproportionality when it comes to African-American males being placed in special education classes. What is the problem when it comes to African-Americans regarding their academic achievement? Is the problem based on a genetic factor? Which is what this all suggests. Are African males genetically inferior to the European counterparts in regard to academics? That's those are the Charles Murray uh, hypothesis. She's saying the natural logical conclusion of calling these things diseases, and African Americans have a lot of them. Right. There's something. Well, but that's the thing wrong. about African Americans. Um, so what? But the question is, if you have a well-meaning society, if you believe in educating people, if you're tolerant, what you say is. Well, these behaviors appear more often. How do we align the system to make them less common? Because there's a course, she describes the course, Lily Barana. She dropped out of high school and now she's writing all these books. I, I don't know. She doesn't say what that transition involved, but not being able to concentrate in school and being punished makes, that, that's what the other analyst was saying makes it less likely that you get to go to college and get all the good things like drinking alcohol to just to tie everything together. Hmm. So there's that contradiction we have never resolved. We don't have the intellectual tools to resolve. We're not going to resolve it in my lifetime and other than you dealing with it as an individual and within your own system, we're not going to resolve it in your lifetime. The question is, how do you recognize and accept different styles of being without being pejorative? And being right. pejorative means punishing it, but it also means labeling it as a disease. Oh, right. she's saying, well, they're, lab they're, they're diseasifying African-Americans. Like these behaviors are something, well, that they're born with and that it's a, it's a racial theory. And so I'm getting back to, you know, what we started about reductionism. Resolving human, behavioral, individual, social problems into a biological nexus 
And one principal way of doing that is to call it a disease, which seems to be so relieving and so promising, hasn't led to its promise of fulfilling things and eliminating social differences is exacerbated them on the one hand. And Lily Baranis seems to be describing the cost to an individual. You know, she only bought a ticket. Her ADHD drove her to buy a ticket to the Springsteen concert. As opposed to, gosh, I like seeing Bruce Springsteen. I went there and bought a ticket. And then when he sang, you know, one of his moving songs, I cried. All of that's not part of her human experience. That's been removed. That's part of what's being removed. And on the one hand, we're welcoming that. And she and her main complaint in life, and that other woman, is that not enough people are being diagnosed with ADHD. There's a bias where people, where the other woman describes a bias in labeling young African American men, they they're putting it in the kettle well, of fish. Women oh, don't bias against labels. women. Women don't get enough labels. Yeah, sort of stark contrast there. So you and I are the last of the Mohicans, along with that woman who worked in New York City School. There's a couple of us roaming around, nutty as can be. Where, but Lily Barana wants a lot of diagnoses. Her life isn't primarily driven by, oh, I like going to concerts, sometimes crying or laughing at them. That's not what her life's about. Her life is about finding out her diseases, medicating them, and eliminating those experiences of want and desire and emotion. She gets so, to have it. What's up? She gets to have that if she wants it. She gets to have it and she gets to write about it if she wants to. Um, right. Of course, if I were interviewing her, I'd say, how did you become a writer? Yeah. What was that process like? By the way, she's also, I, I take her last book to be about being religious too. So that gets back to, well, AA, you know, is deferring to a higher power. Mm -hmm. And it's combined with brain chemistry. Mm -hmm. All right, we've covered enough of the world's mysteries and debits and debacles and trends. And nobody, nobody in America thinks we're a happier society than we were in 1980. Nobody thinks that. We'll do our little bit to try and make people happy, Zach, with this little podcast.